Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope that uh, that you can all see me and uh, and hear me. Uh, my name is David Nahai, and I'm uh, privileged to to chair uh, this uh, uh, panel, the water panel, uh, uh, called "Providing Clean, Affordable Water for All Californians." And um, uh, I'd like, first of all, to truly commend the Los Angeles Business Council for putting on this conference under uh, really trying uh, uh, circumstances. Um, I want to thank Mary Leslie, uh, Adam Lane, Rachel Levy, Dina Mesa, Harris Rosenblum, the whole team uh, for all of the work that they've done to make this a reality. Thanks also to our chairs, Nadine Watt and Brad Cox for all of their work. Uh, we have a stellar uh, panel for you today. Um, uh, with us today is the Honorable uh, Henry Stern, uh, our brilliant chair of the Natural Resources and Water Committee of the State Senate. Um, uh, Gilles Crosses, partner at Corolla Engineers, is with us. Rupam Soni of the Metropolitan Water District. Director Enrique Zaldivar, uh, who heads the uh, Los Angeles Sanitation and Environment Department of the City of Los Angeles, is, is uh, with us. Uh, as well, as well is Brian Jordan of Tetra Tech uh, is joining us today. Um, we have just an hour and we have a, a lot of uh, ground to cover. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose uh, a question to each one of our panelists and ask them to limit their response to, to three minutes so that we can make sure that we get in three rounds of questions and give everybody a chance to participate fully. Um, before doing that though, let me just provide a little bit of context for our talk today. Uh, and this will take maybe four or five minutes to do before we launch into our program with our panelists. Really the word transformation uh, would hardly does justice to the choppy waters that we're experiencing in the water sector right now in California and here locally uh, in, uh, in the Los Angeles area. On the state level, the one tunnel initiative that everybody knows about is like inching along, uh, but not without deep entrenched uh, uh, opposition. Uh, meanwhile, the Trump administration uh, is continuing its unrelenting efforts to assert control over California's water policies, which has prompted yet another uh, lawsuit uh, by California against Trump in order to, to protect itself. Very recently in July, Governor Newsom unveiled his water resilience portfolio to, to again, try to defend California against the ravages of, uh, of climate change with far reaching uh, ramifications. Uh, I'm personally saddened that the climate resilience bond, nearly $8 billion, uh, to, uh, November, to the November ballot uh, of the COVID pandemic uh, and all of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, here locally, uh, um, we are continuing our struggle uh, to, to uh, secure a, a, a sustainable water system uh, for the future of Los Angeles and the mayor's Green New Deal uh, with its uh, goals to recycle 100% of our wastewater and source 70% of our water locally by the year 2035 are truly necessary uh, objectives to reach for, but uh, they, they will entail billions of dollars of investment and, and uh, a lot of political capital to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that they reach fruition at a time when the public profits are really severely constrained. Our water infrastructure, our underground pipes continue age and deteriorate and the need uh, urgent uh, uh, attention. Um, uh, here, the UCLA Luskin Center recently found that a number of water agencies are failing to meet basic standards in the provision of water. Uh, is it not time uh, for all of us in the sector to think about public-private partnerships, uh, about leveraging private capital, uh, perhaps in doing performance-based contracts uh, while ensuring that water belongs to the people and ensuring that workers are protected, that union concerns 
expected, um, but that we tried to bring private capital meet social uh, objectives and requirements. There is one bright spot that I do want to point to. Well, there are lots of bright spots, but the one that I'd like to point out is LA County's Measure W. Uh, the voters two years ago in LA County uh, voted uh, to infuse a uh, potential of $280 annually into the water sector to fund stormwater capture projects. Uh, I'm privileged to chair a um, watershed area steering committee uh, as part of the structure for the implementation of, uh, of Measure W. And uh, that next week, uh, the Board of Supervisors will approve the stormwater investment plans that are the product of the whole Measure W process. Uh, and with that, the money will start to flow to fund these projects for water quality benefits, water quantity benefits, production of jobs, um, spurring economic activity at a time when that is needed. Uh, but I really would like to hear from our panelists, Measure W, how are we measuring up, if you'll forgive the pun. All right. And with that, uh, let me turn to our panelists. And I would like to start with, uh, with our brilliant uh, Senator Stern. So the question that I would start with you on, Senator Stern, is climate change looks like a multifaceted attack. Uh, on California, from a diminished snowpack to the, the horrific fire, to the heat storm we just had to go through, sea level rise. I mean, it doesn't seem to stop and it's here with us now. Nobody can, can call it a hoax anymore or to call it something to be dealt with in the future. And it's only going to get um, So my question is for you as in your capacity as a leader uh, on environmental issues, and as chair of the committee you lead, what is it that we need to do? How do you see the future and how do you see us dealing with, with the climate change challenges? Well, thank you, David, for the uh, kind acknowledgement as a leader. I'm still fairly new to legislature. I'm uh, getting into the end of my very first term here, but I have to say, leaning on LABC, and what Mary and Brad and Nadine and all the partners you brought together, you are our renewable resource uh, in policy making. And we're, you know, before I even got started in the Senate, um, just a, a font of knowledge and a place to actually cross silos and share ideas. So thanks again for having me back. And um, in terms of what the future looks like, I think, you know, this, this crisis is, forced us to rethink and maybe be bolder and more radical in our reimagination of what we can be. I think uh, there are a lot of things people thought were impossible and a society um, that's been completely atomized and fractured in the way it has been over the last several months, I think is on the one hand, um, a very bleak and dystopian um, prelude to the future, but if you start to rethink uh, what small means and what small and distributed life means, even me zooming in here today and all the other participants um, able to connect um, through new platforms, I'm actually quite hopeful that we are, as a people, able to adapt to radical change very quickly and that people are starting to realize that we're more interconnected than ever, that the actions you take are something that actually affect other people in a very concrete way. And infrastructure is one of those places where you don't really think about uh, your complicity or your interconnection often to other people. When you turn on your faucet, it's your water in your mind. You don't think about the fact that maybe it came from um, the far Northern Sierras or that it came from a a shower out in Sunland to Hunga and suddenly is, um, you know, you're able to cook your pasta with it. Um, there is a, a revelation around the, the distribution of infrastructure and all of our ability to, to lean on it that I, I hope 
shows our path to a new kind of resilience that isn't solely reliant as the mayor is so, um, so aptly put in his vision for 2035. And that's solely reliant on the North and on the, the tough, hard scrabbled regional politics of water where it's not as much Republicans versus Democrats, but it's interest versus interest and regions versus regions and really trying to build an independent water future for Southern California and for Los Angeles in particular, uh, I think is incredibly hopeful. Uh, I think it's embedded in the governor's water resilience portfolio that uh, he laid out, which I'm a, I'm a supporter of, um, but all this vision takes uh, more, than, more than words and more than laws, it takes money. And I'm really glad you brought up Measure W. Um, I, uh, I think in this new era, financing is gonna have to be rethought of and de-siloed if we're actually gonna be able to achieve this kind of distributed and decentralized and independent future. Uh, you have measures say at the city level, like Measure O. We have a project that's going up uh, around stormwater treatment, very exciting on Aliso Creek, for instance. Um, but that's over in the Measure O city bond silo. Then there's Measure W uh, running alongside um, the leftovers of our last water bond. And if the state legislature hopefully steps up next session, we're gonna be reintroducing our climate resilience bond. Um, I haven't announced that publicly until now, but um, we don't intend to let up. The climate crisis is not getting smaller. In fact, it's getting larger. So I think um, we're actually, the, the $5.5 billion draft that came out of the, the Senate and the governor's proposal, uh, which I really appreciated him putting forward. Uh, the assembly, unfortunately, uh, didn't see fit to, to move that through. Um, and it stalled out in the other house. But I'd actually like to see us come back even bigger. I think I think the voters, in fact, are being denied an opportunity. I think they'd actually double down on a climate resilience investment, not just to protect themselves from the climate future that's burning us all down. And it's, you know, as Secretary Crowfoot just put on the last panel has Woodland Hills at 121 degrees, but also because they know we've got to do something. We've got to build things if we're actually going to find our way through it and find a way through the politics. Work is healing. We can, we can, fight on Twitter, but when you're actually building a, a new stormwater treatment system, it doesn't matter if you're serving a Republican or a Democratic household. Um, that work, I truly think, can be a source of, of healing for, for this region and this whole country. Um, and I hope that if we can find a partner at the federal level, we can start to bust silos all over the place. A $2 trillion infrastructure investment uh, from the feds that uh, Biden laid out to me is incredibly inspiring. And if you if you combine the vision of a $2 trillion federal investment uh, alongside uh, the state stepping up and putting something forward to voters say in 2022, call it a $10 billion climate resilience bond, I think we could actually go bigger, but uh, I, I definitely think we get that passed. Um, if you start to put that alongside the visionary work at the county level, and LA County San is really stepped up, um, had, uh, engineered and, and pushed through this, uh, this Aliso project I just mentioned. But if you start to put city, local, county, statewide, even start thinking about new special districting, LA River should be an enhanced infrastructure finance district. We're sitting there uh, ready to capture uh, that potential. The groundwater aquifers of the San Fernando Valley, we're starting to get there for that cleanup and make a resilient water bank right here in our backyards. But we've got to think outside of our silos. And I'd like to see some institutional innovation in that regard. Right. Uh, right. For there not to be so much competition, uh, who, you know, who, who puts out the press release, uh, but really for us at all levels of government to say, we got to get out of our own way and get to work. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that the humility that this crisis has forced on all of us and showing raw form, our mortality, has made us much less worried about our careers and our standing and our silos and much more interested in what we are to actually do here as people and as Angelinos and 
I, um, I think we're up for it. I think if anywhere on this planet is up for it, it's us here. So, um, you know, to that water future, um, I, I, I'm more hopeful than ever. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. You, you actually just justified my uh, labeling you as a, as a, as a leader uh, with that talk. And, and I think we all hope that the climate resilience bond uh, will come back and will be put back on the ballot, uh, you know, bigger and better. And, and I also absolutely agree with you that the voters uh, would see the value in that, would see the value in the investment, would see the value in the economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, spur that, that, it would, that it would provide, the jobs that it would create, as well as protecting us from, from the horrors of climate change, which uh, unfortunately we're right at the beginning of. Um, let me turn to Rupam. Uh, next of MWD. Rafam, thank you for, for joining us. Um, so uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, MWD's recycled water project, the regional recycled water. Recycled water has to be more and more uh, a, a part of our, part of our future. Um, and for many years, MWD supported other agencies. But now it is tackling its own. Effort. Can you tell us more about the project, where it stands? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question, David. I love talking about this project. It's fantastic. So um, as you know, Metropolitan is a regional water wholesaler. and We provide water to our 26 member agencies who in turn serve 19 million people. And one of the things that we've done is help fund some of their local water supply projects, including their re recycled water projects. As you mentioned, yes, for the first time, we are pursuing our own recycled water project, the Regional Recycled Water Program, to take wastewater, treated wastewater that's currently sent to the ocean, purify it, and reuse it eventually as drinking water. So let's get a little bit more into the details of the program. We're working with the LA County Sanitation Districts. They have a huge wastewater treatment plant located in Carson. Um, it's got a flow of about 260 million gallons per day and all of that water currently, once it's treated, goes to the ocean. And this is the largest untapped source of wastewater in California. Um, and so for us, it was a great opportunity as well as for the sanitation districts. We started talking to them over 10 years ago about doing something like this. So what we would do is instead of sending some of that water to the ocean, we would take it, construct an advanced water treatment plant, purify it, and then this would be a potable reuse project. So we would send that water to groundwater basins in the region in LA and Orange County to help refill those basins. We rely heavily on groundwater throughout our region as a water supply. The state is also right now working on regulations for direct potable reuse. So we would be able to take that water and send it to our existing water treatment plants, upstream of those plants, where it would com could combine with our other water sources. So we also import water from the Colorado River and from Northern California. It could go into our water treatment plants and then go out through our regional delivery system. We have over 800 miles of pipeline to get that water to a majority of our service area. Um, and then on top of that, there's also non-potable reuse opportunities. We're looking at using some of that water for industrial use. The scale of this project is incredible. So 150 million gallons per day is what we're looking at. That's about 168,000 acre feet. Um, you know, uh, acre foot is enough for three homes per year. So that's enough water for 500,000 homes. So it would be like one of the largest programs of its kind in the world. It's about a quarter of the, the recycled water that California is currently producing throughout the whole state. And in, in the past few months, we've been making um, huge progress on this project. So in October, we began operating a demonstration facility uh, on, at the LA County Sanitation District's property. Um, and what we're doing there is we're testing an innovative purification process. And we're getting, working to get regulatory approval of that process so it can be used by any water reuse facility throughout the state. We've also been working on partnerships. You can't do this project alone, um, like any project. And so, yes, we have our key partner, the LA County Sanitation Districts. We're working with our groundwater basin managers to make sure that there's 
the, the capacity to take this water in their basins. But some of the other interesting partnerships that have come up is we're starting to work with the Southern Nevada Water Authority and the Central Arizona Project um, and looking at this project. And we've been working with those agencies for years on issues around the Colorado River. We all rely on the Colorado River as a water supply. So we're, we're looking at how does it work? How can we work together to, to read more of that water in the Colorado River? And how can they support that, that project and allow us to work collectively on the Colorado River, which has been in a long-term drought? So that's really exciting stuff. We're also working with the State Water Resources Control Board to help push forward some of those regulations for direct potable reuse and do research and support their efforts along with um, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Uh, so that's been really exciting. And then now our board in November will vote on whether to move forward with the next step in this in our program, which is the environmental planning process. And so that's really a big step for us at Metropolitan to come so far in the world of water reuse. We're really excited for this program. I personally am also really excited. I used to work for the LA County Sanitation Districts and I've loved recycled water for years and years and years. So this project feels like it's my whole career that's come together in one. Um, and I feel like this project is huge for our region, for water in the Southwest and for water reuse in, in California and throughout the world. Great, great. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me turn next to, to Director Zaldivar, Enrique. Uh, it's, it's great to see you again. Um, so the question, uh, I have for you uh, regards, of course, your work at LA Sanitation and Environment. And, you know, you deal with the treatment of wastewater throughout the city. Um, and I'm wondering uh, what challenges you're facing now in turn in, you know, in the time of COVID with, uh, you know, with people staying home and, and with, the, with, with the change in patterns of behavior uh, that, uh, that we're seeing. What, what is it that you're, that you're experiencing? Uh, tell us just a little bit how your work has changed in this time of COVID. Well, thank you, David. And uh, thank you for having me on this panel. I want to first uh, thank uh, Senator Stern for the plug he put in for that one particular project, uh, Aliso Canyon and Lime Kiln uh, Creek in Northridge, it's a proper stormwater capture, some infiltration, but water quality for sure. And uh, so thank you, Senator. Uh, I, I can see that that project is on your radar. Not that I needed more pressure to make sure that that project uh, is done on time and as, as promised, but uh, I, I now have more pressure. Uh, but um, yes, uh, being a essential frontline first responder for service uh, agency, David. Um, COVID was particularly challenging in the first two months with regards to some of the unknowns that came with COVID, uh, transmittability, uh, level of contagion. Is it airborne, is it not? Is it in wastewater? Is it in stormwater? Is it in our solid waste? And so there was a great deal of apprehension on the part of our staff across the board, for sure, the first line responders uh, who needed to come to work because we have a critical service to provide the city in, in all three of our programs and many of our programs, but for sure, wastewater treatment as well as solid waste services. And so uh, very difficult yet, you know, I came to see the resolve and, and the, the uh, commitment to duty that our staff have shown, uh, much as we have seen from so many other sectors, our health service, uh, employees, firefighters, uh, you name it, all the first responders, uh, we were able to make it past the first two months being the worst. It doesn't mean, of course, that we now are very much under normal conditions. We worry about our staff every single day. We have had uh, close to 80 cases of test positives and uh, we uh, have had one of our employees um, pass away 
oh. from COVID. And so very difficult uh, still. And, and yet uh, we know that our services must continue. And uh, so I am very thankful and appreciative to all of our staff and our leaders, our seated leaders, uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Garcetti, our council president, Nuri, uh, Martinez and the entire city council have uh, been incredible in supporting uh, city employees, supporting my staff. And uh, that's how we've been able to uh, carry through uh, uh, this COVID response. Well, uh, thank you. And, and uh, let me also uh, thank you on behalf of all of us for your service to the city these many years uh, through through thick and thin and many challenges you've been there so i want to thank you for that and please also accept our our condolences on on the loss of your staff member i i know that uh i know firsthand that the that the sanitation family is a very close-knit one and so it must be very painful uh to lose somebody i'm sorry to to hear it and sorry for your loss thank you um, uh, uh, Brian, uh, allow me to turn to you um, next uh, as uh, you're here for, for Tetra Tech. So in February uh, of 2019, uh, Mayor Garcetti announced the Green New Deal plan uh, and, the, and the, the ambitious uh, but very necessary goals that are contained within it with respect to, to the water sector. Um, tell us, what is it that you see in terms of private sector contribution you know people always talk in terms of you know what benefits is are there to the private sector i want to rephrase that where is it that the private sector can help uh, our city reach these uh, these essential uh, objectives and and how, how do you see the private sector and the public sector coming together around these um, these initiatives yeah, it's a good question. Thanks for thanks for having me on the panel, and thanks for LABC for putting together such a great program. I, I think Senator Stern really um, highlighted in his remarks. He called for bolder, more radical change, and I think the the Green New Deal, the um, sustainability plan that the city has, that's a good framework or or roadmap for um, what the city wants to accomplish and how the city can help the state and help the the country and ultimately help the the entire world achieve that bolder, more radical change. And you know, Enrique just highlighted what's going on with COVID and how it's impacting uh, them at the, at the at the local level. But but if you if you think about what uh, sustainability plans typically uh, focus on with respect to water, a lot of times you hear about conservation and what the most recent plan did and what the Green New Deal um, uh, uh, is focused on achieving, uh, which you highlighted in in your opening remarks. David is advancing that and looking at other aspects of, of water and sustainability and then, and then integrating it as, as well. So 100% recycled water, 70% um, local water by um, 2035. Uh, Director Zavadar certainly has his, his hands full. You know, he spent uh, 15 years as, as director uh, with, with a variety of, of focus on investments on the system as a whole for the clean water and wastewater and stormwater and Hyperion and the other treatment plants. And he's going to spend the next 15 years uh, uh, focused on implementing uh, uh, recycled water facilities at, uh, at Hyperion now. So pr pretty exciting uh, for him, I'm, I'm sure. And, and Rupan just touched on it as well. It's not just investments that, that the city of Los Angeles needs to make, but there's regional collaboration. And, and as, as Senator Stern highlighted, there's got to be statewide uh, collaboration. Ultimately, we have to get the entire country behind this because most of the world understands these these risks, and it's it's frustrating at times how, how we can't um, uh, as a country get behind it behind it locally. But right now, you know that that when, when it rains and, and and the treated water that leaves the plant that largely goes out to the um, to, to the ocean, and, and the plan that um, the, the Green New Deal lays out. Uh, works on investments that change that. I think the challenge is in the last um, six months, uh, eight months here is the, the reality of, uh, of the near-term issues with, with COVID versus uh, what has to be in the long-term to, to implement all this by 2035. So we have success on those, on those plans. I think that's where the private sector and the public sector can, can really work together. So uh, as you, you mentioned, what can the private sector uh, bring to the table? Not necessarily what are the what are the benefits? And, and it's that partnership, that, that collaboration. I think where the private sector 
uh, benefits is, is with organizations that um, are able to see how other um, organizations across the country, throughout the world, how different regions and different areas of the uh, of the country or, or different parts of the continent have dealt with these challenges and the, some of the solutions, whether it's um, innovative ideas, uh, new technology, accelerating uh, delivery, re reducing costs. Um, th th there's a lot of benefit. When, when you can bring really smart people in the public sector and really smart people in the private sector together. There's recent examples here that we've been fortunate enough to, to be involved with. The uh, Water Replenishment District of Southern California just opened their uh, Albert Robles Center in Pico Rivera. Um, it's, it's producing recycled water. It's uh, uh, um, putting that recycled water into the groundwater basin for future use. And the MWD project that Rupam um, just highlighted and uh, the project that uh, Director Zalvador is going to implement um, with DWP and LA San working together will, will be a much larger version of that. On, on the stormwater side, uh, uh, Senator highlighted the uh, uh, Lisa Linekiln project. There's there's other really exciting Prop O and, and, and Measure W projects that'll come down the, the pipeline. The Albion Riverside Park is a fantastic example where um, an underutilized area adjacent to the L LA River uh, brownfield uh, is now a, a beautiful park that's um, benefiting water quality and water supply throughout the, the region and, and a variety of um, different uh, city of LA uh, departments and, and other uh, stakeholders collaborated to, to implement that. So I think with creativity, uh, dedication and investment, uh, we, we can see the benefits of, of those projects as they, uh, as they advance and, and as the sustainability plan goes from just a vision to uh, reality. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today, Brian. And you, know, you always do such a nice job leading the water charrette uh, at the Verdi Exchange Conference. I always appreciate you. And I was trying very hard to make out what that plaque is right behind you to see <laughs> which university <laughs> you had graduated Virginia. from. But... <laughs> I, I, I tried to figure that out too. I think it's University of Virginia. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't know, but, but, you know, but I think it's a good idea. Next time, all of us should line up the various credentials we have on the wall for everybody to try to figure out what they are. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Gilles, let's, uh, let's turn to, to you next. And uh, uh, Carolo, well, first of all, thanks so much for being here with us today. Uh, Corolla has developed and built advanced water systems, you know, across the Southwest United States. Um, and you're seeing many new technologies, uh, you know, come to the table. Um, uh, I will want to ask you, Gilles, about the next, in the next round, about public-private partnerships and so on. But, but for now, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about the advances in technology, what kind of innovations you're seeing, uh, how you see innovations in, in, in water treatment uh, impact uh, the future of the water industry, um, uh, tell us a little bit about that. I think you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, David, and thank you to the LABC for having me. Um, yeah, when it comes to uh, technology, as you know, Corolla, all we do is water, so we can talk about this, but when it comes to portable reuse in the West, the major technological shift that we've seen in our last decade is uh, a, sh a shift in paradigm where in the past, um, wastewater was treated to a level suitable to go to the uh, receiving water body. And as reuse started, we would scalp some of that effluent and start reusing it. Today, the approach is a little different and seeks to better integrate wastewater treatment in a way that is recyclable. And with that, there's a technology in particular I want to mention. It's, the, it's called the membrane bioreactor uh, that has come about at a scalable uh, level in the last 10 years. And uh, <clears throat> this technology is very compact. It treats very high solids level, and it uses membranes to separate those solids, which makes it a very uh, suitable pre-treatment for advanced treatment that is required downstream to make the water suitable for portable reuse. Now that technology is suitable, is um, uh, scalable, is very compact. And uh, when it comes to projects like the Hyperion retrofit, it makes it really feasible in light of 
many severe constraints, uh, whether it's spatially or operationally, that we need to face when implementing these projects. To some extent, also the MWD project. But I think the technology, uh, technological advances also span uh, much broader than the treatment, uh, in particular monitoring. Uh, as you know, recycling water, portable reuse requires uh, a safety level that is unprecedented, and that will come with uh, advanced monitoring methods. So there's a, a huge amount of research uh, taking place in that sector. Finally, uh, energy optimization. I mean, here we are at the Sustainability Summit. We're trying to balance uh, water uh, uh, resiliency, but also we need to keep energy in mind and not increase the energy footprint of the new water projects. All right. Um, thank you very much, Il. Thanks so much for, for that response. Um, Senator Cern, let me return to you then for the next round of, of questions. And, you know, we hear so much about sustainability and resilience, and these, these have become, you know, part of the part of the permanent part of the vernacular that we use. But what does a resilient water system actually look like uh, to you? Um, and I and, and I asked that question, you know, against the background of the of the UCLA study that I uh, that I mentioned earlier, which found that so many of our systems here in LA County, I mean, here in the United States of America, are failing to provide, you know, basic, clean, affordable water to their constituents. And there is one agency that, that has kind of become the, the poster child for this. And maybe if there's time, we'll return to that. But for now, if you could, from the state level, just um, tell us what is it that can be done from the state's point of view in order to, to ensure that the human rights to water uh, actually becomes a, a reality for the people of California. Look, I think there's a, there's a bit of a risk in the quick fix and in relying solely on small systems, um, very small systems, point of use, um, that look in a, in a pinch, it's, it's important, but to me, Hyperion is the future of resilience. Um, finding ways to connect and interconnect all these, uh, end uses and make them not an end, but a new beginning. Um, it does require, however, core investments in centralized infrastructure. You think about all the mobile home parks and the RVs and all the people who out there who uh, beyond our, our basin and my family lives in the Central Valley in Porterville and you look at what East Porterville's going been going through for years. Um, you know, people do what they got to do to be able to survive. And that's why water and clean water and clean drinking water is a right. It's not a privilege. But to me, resilience is is about leveraging distributed resources into smart regional centralized infrastructure, but it's also about affordability and finding economies of scale. Uh, resilience isn't just about environmental resilience. It's the durability of a project economically, um, the ability not to have a two-tiered society where some people get access to clean water and others don't. Um, so it's, there, there's more embedded, I think, in that concept there's equity that has to really be a, a bottom line guarantee within the resilience portfolio. And I, I truly do believe that um, this Hyperion project and others like it um, are really at, at the backbone of, of what is going to be required to, to get that done. And, you know, where, where the supply will come from, from for a project like Hyperion is from all over the Southland. So, conveyance system, stormwater movement, pretreatment, finding smart uses all over the place. Um, combining, for instance, that pretreatment with say parklands and bioswales and other ways to rewild uh, LA and bring some green life back to us. This isn't just pipes and concrete. Um, it's, it's things you can touch and feel and that have huge co-benefits as well. Um, so I think that um, the future of resilience is, is really in, in a self-reliance that, that is a smart version of self-reliance. 
you're not going to have the ability to drill your own well, and you shouldn't have to worry about those things yourself. Um, there is value in economics and scale, um, but not such huge scale that we're just doing the way things we've already always done things. Um, and I, I do worry that uh, the easy and default answer will be to rely on technology of the past or conveyance of the past. Um, so MET has been, you know, leading the charge here along with County San and the city and DWP and all our other partners here, but um, we're all in it together, they say, right? But when that togetherness actually comes together, um, those are the places that resilience takes hold. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Rupam, going back uh, to you, um, the Metropolitan Water District is, is going through its own uh, transformation. Um, uh, you know, things are changing in the water sector. Uh, you know, we've seen that with the whole discussion about the tunnel and, and where our water is coming from and, and the city's drive to, to lessen its reliance on imported water. And we're seeing that throughout the region. Um, how will MWD effectively change its long-term uh, business model? Um, yeah, you, 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 you spoke to us about MWD's own recycled uh, water project, but, but what else uh, are we seeing in the future for MWD as it copes with, uh, with the changes in, in the water picture? Yeah, um, thank you for that question, David. Uh, so, you know, we got our start at Metropolitan Importing Water. We brought in water from the Colorado River, then Northern California. Then back in, let's go back to the 1980s, things, you know, we're changing our population, our economy, we're growing. Um, there was the risk of earthquakes and we were looking at our water supply and thinking we needed to do more to make sure that we had a reliable water supply for future generations. We started um, an integrated resources plan to look at how do we plan for the future for decades to come. We did that first in 1990. At that time, about 65% of our water was imported water and the remainder was local resources. And what we wanna do is we wanna flip that. In 2040, we want 65% to be local water supply and 35% to be imported. And we've been making a lot of progress. So we invested heavily in our local water supplies. Um, I talked a little bit about our local resources program. So giving financial investments to our member agencies to pursue their own projects, um, recycled water projects, groundwater projects. Another place we've made huge investments is conservation. And what's great about conservation is it requires everyone working together uh, to conserve water. So we have rebate programs. For example, if you pull out your grass and you put in native and drought tolerant landscaping, we give you a rebate for that. Uh, we give you rebates for water saving devices like low flow toilets and shower heads. Um, in commercial facilities as well too, we have a number of rebates that we give. And if we don't have a rebate for your type of business, we will customize one for you. Uh, we also right now, we have a program called our Innovative Conservation Program, where we're giving grants to people who come up with ideas and research for water saving devices um, and improving water efficiency throughout uh, however you use water. And all those things help uh, help progress and in water innovation in the future. Um, so there's all kinds of programs and things that we've done. And the incredible thing is we are seeing huge, huge results. So this last year, these programs were the equivalent to about 1.5 million acre feet of water. That is more than we get from any aqueduct, any one of our imported water supplies, that is more than that. Our conservation programs alone are the equivalent of what we would get from one of our imported water supplies. So we're all doing an incredible job saving water, um, whether it be through outdoor use or indoor use, or just you know turning off the, the faucet whenever we have a chance. Um, it's really, really, really made huge improvements in our, uh, our water outlook for the future. We are, our um, integrated resource plan is like an evolving document. So every few years we update it. We work with stakeholders and partners to look at what does our water um, supply portfolio look like in the future? What are some of the challenges ahead? We're working on our 2020 plan now and there are 
lots of challenges facing us in the world of water. There's climate change, changing regulations, and there's an opportunity for people to get involved in this process, to plan for a water future. We will be having our stakeholder workshops and public workshops coming this fall. So I encourage everyone who's interested to get involved with that. Um, it's really a great opportunity to think about what is coming for our future and what we can do about it today to make a difference. Unmute myself. Um, hi, uh, Rupam. Thank you. There, there was, I think, a little bit of an interruption in the in the uh, connection of some kind. Um, uh, Director Zaldivar, Enrique, if, if you're still there, I hope. Um, I'd like I'd like to turn to you. We've heard uh, a lot uh, about Hyperion and uh, and the very ambitious project to cease discharges of wastewater into the ocean altogether and, uh, and, uh, and retreat, recycle that water uh, ultimately for potable use uh, through indirect or perhaps even direct a potable use. Uh, but this is will, it will cost by some estimates over $10 billion. Can you tell us a little bit about the project? Uh, in, we have a little time, we have 10 minutes left, but tell us about the project and in particular, where is it that you and DWP and the mayor's office and the city council believe we'll be able to find the money uh, in, order to, in order to do what is absolutely necessary here? Well, thank you, David. I mean, that, that is one of the reasons why I agree to be on this panel. So I can start asking for money to all of you. <laughs> but, you know, it, clearly, you know, Hyperion to all of us really means more than a facility. Hyperion was the place that turned the water quality in the Santa Monica Bay around. It, it made going to the beach possible uh, over the last 30 years. Hyperion is a mythical place, a place of inspiration, a place of beauty. Anyone of you who has stood on the rooftop of the Environmental Learning Center, it looks out to the sunset or the sunrise or just out to the bay. It comes out inspired. And so, you know, we have benefited from the incredible political leadership from Mayor Garcetti, clearly, and our city council, Council President Nori Martinez, but making a goal of recycling all of our wastewater by 2035, you know, that, it, that was the leadership we needed. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is solved already. You heard Jill talk about the technologies that we're bringing to bear at Hyperion. The one thing that I am very optimistic about is that we have all hands on deck. And by that, I mean city leadership, departmental resolve, uh, stakeholders, multi-agencies. I mean, we, when we take on the, all of the difficult technology challenges, for example, uh, you talked about climate change, David, and you know we're dealing right now with a, a best technology to apply to the peaking effects of the flows that come into Hyperion. Right now, under wet weather, Hyperion peaks at one billion gallons per day. Now that approaches catastrophic levels, one billion gallons. Now imagine the extremes under a climate change new scenario where a peak could be one and a half billion. Who knows what that peak is going to be and how do we deal with the technology, technologically speaking, so that's an incredible challenge, but I believe that we have all of the elements to be able to address that. Not cheaply, you hit it on the nail there, David, not cheaply. Energy consumption. I mean, we gotta optimize how much energy 
we utilize to produce a, gal a million gallons of water or in, in Rupam's terms, one acre foot of water. And so, and then there's the issue of a brine discharge into the ocean. You know, we have sought as a goal of everyone in LA sand to seize discharge of anything into the ocean. Brine now under a recycled water reg regime becomes a real consideration. What, what will we be able to do technologically speaking when it comes to brine? So we have everybody at the table so that we can figure this out in the most optimal way for the good of the region, the good of Angelinos, the good of Californians. And so um, I, I think, you know, it's not like we have it all figured out. We have a lot of it figured out. And I wanna say the partnership between us and DWP and the West Basin Municipal Water District also has already advanced us this far. We're not squabbling over whether we should pay for something, front the money, they should pay us in advance and what have you. That squabbling would not have gone us anywhere. So there's great harmony in at the operational level, at the department level. And now I see a lot of harmony with all of the larger stakeholders uh, around making this project a reality by 2035. Thank you, Enrique. And and yeah, you said you know we need all hands on deck, and uh, and you're right. We be we both need all hands on deck, and we need all funding choices on deck as well, because this has to be a, a combination of uh, of of, uh, of the bond sales, uh, 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 the, the Feds, hopefully with the next administration understanding the importance of of this. Um, and at some point, the rate pairs, uh, the, there has to be an entire campaign that has to be launched in order to do it. And, and thank you for your leadership on it. Um, I've just been told by uh, uh, Rachel Levy and, uh, and uh, Adam Lane at, uh, at uh, LABC that they're going to accord us an extra 10 minutes so we can go until 155, which really makes me very, very happy because this has been such a fascinating um, uh, discussion so far, and I want to thank you all uh, for it. Um, let me turn uh, back to to Brian, and I want to talk a little bit about about uh, Measure W here, Brian, and and from Tetratech's point of view, how you see it uh, working with the first round of of projects. Um, do you see the private sector being brought into uh, this whole uh, process with this in, enormous amount of money uh, getting injected into into the industry. How are you seeing Measure W working? Yeah, well, first I'll, I'll compliment Senator Stern's vision if uh, he can see <laughs> the diploma there from Virginia, that, that impression. I, I, I think it's also uh, to, to weave that into to this question, the vision of the um, those who work so hard to to create Measure W to, to get the enabling legislation and ultimately help the voters pass it is, is why we're here uh, today. And, and fortunately now we're, we're focused on the implementation side of, uh, of things. And, and what, what I see is and hear a lot is a, a narrative or, or false dichotomy in, in some circles that um, you know, the, the public sector is proposing some projects and the, uh, you know, the nonprofits are proposing some projects and the, Private sector might be involved, and and and, and what's really uh, going to um, benefit the region as a whole is, is for collaboration amongst all those parties. So, I think when, whenever possible, the the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, uh, co collaboration should be the focus. And I know, um, you know, you're you're intimately familiar with it, David, in, in your role. Um, in the Measure W funding process, but but the more these different sectors can can work together, the more uh, they can enable implementation, and the more they can incentivize it. I think the, the better off we are. Each of them have uh, good ideas. Individuals have good ideas. Organizations have good ideas. These sectors have have good ideas. And if we can incentivize, enable those partnerships, I think uh, all the sectors stand to, to benefit. And if everyone can benefit, um, you know, it's saying all, all boats rise and. The, and the rising tide is is true as well. So I know we're 
running out of time, but, but that's what I would, uh, that's what I would encourage and, and like to see more. Thank the, um, the, the entire Measure W team for turning this vision into a reality. And now that we've gone through one year of, of the process, um, that those who, who got funding and those are who, who are going to come back for funding, uh, look to continue to build on those concepts and collaborate more and look for the, these multi-benefit projects that can benefit the region. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, Gilles, uh, coming back to to you uh, again, I want to I want to continue on this the the, the public the private public public private uh, partnership um, uh, theme. Um, it, you know, there, there uh, you, you talked about new technologies on, on the horizon. There are also new business models. There are companies that are that do performance based contracting that are willing to to fund the capital needed for a project upfront, while again respecting uh, you know, union requirements, respecting worker rights, respecting environmental um, uh, requirements, uh, and and get paid for their labor at the very end when the, a project is is complete. And in many respects, we've seen that evolution happen on the energy side, not quite yet on on the water side. And for aging water infrastructure, there are companies that do you know in situ lining, for instance, another. Uh, you know technologies. Um, how do you do? You, do you see um, uh, uh, an adequate uh, readiness uh, on the part of government to 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 welcome these new methods of doing business, these new technologies? Um, uh, how 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 do you see it? Are we are we seeing uh, more of a, of a level of acceptance? for things that are new because we're living in changing times or, uh, you know, let us have your view of that. Yes, thank you. Or, first of all, I think the city and, and public agencies, they're, they're facing a major paradox. Uh, so on one hand, in, in current times, they have to be very fiscally and financially conscious. On the other hand, they're asked to deliver these large programs that we, we discussed. So the private sector, yes, will have a key role to play. The question you ask me is how? And so far, I mean, I, I can just kind of trace a little bit the, the history um, of, of uh, that evolution. And I'll start by saying that, you know, as far as opportunities for the private sector, I mean, the, the, the city in particular and districts have had very uh, well-functioning business inclusion programs, which has translated into local opportunities for smaller uh, say disadvantaged uh, enterprise. And, and that can be reinforced. Uh, I can think of one project that uh, has put a flavor of local business into it, and that's to be experienced and, and see how that, what it yields. Um, more broadly, the delivery methods of the projects, and I think that's what you're referring to, has also evolved quite a bit. Um, right now, there's many uh, alternative delivery projects at play in the city, in the county. They use uh, delivery methods such as construction management at risk, progressive design build, fixed price design build. Uh, but those don't quite involve the financing piece. Um, and I'll come back to that. So th those alternative delivery uh, methods have a tendency to accelerate the projects, which, by the way, is... Uh, very much needed to meet the timeline of, let's say, the city of LA Green New Deal in 2035. Those are like almost like a prerequisite. Um, the private funding that we've seen um, and, and more the performance-based contracting you described usually is being applied to what I call non-core businesses or, or activities of a public agency. Uh, for instance, um, the city of LA is looking at one of those um, delivery methods for a food waste uh, processing facility. It's not exactly the core business. And, and I think that broad definition of what applies, what doesn't apply um, uh, has been used across the industry quite a bit. It has not completely taken off. I think it's frost with a lot of challenges in particular, how you measure performance. Uh, we talked a lot about measure W. There is a project back East on the order of $100 million that is a public-private partnership with funding. However, it's proven very difficult to evaluate the performance when you have uh, criteria such as benefiting the community 
uh, those are pretty broad, broadly defined. And sometimes when you write a contract, you're a lawyer, it gets a little uh, tricky to, um, to, uh, to translate into uh, quantifiable uh, metrics. So I think it's, it's gonna happen, it's needed in some ways. If, you, if I could, in the interest of time, but I'll keep it short, but I think one of the prerequisites for the private sector to be fully engaged uh, is that the local governments really also have their own resources to manage it, to lead it, to administer it. And I think it's a bit of a mistake to say, oh, we're just gonna hand it over and uh, see you, you know, we'll, it, it all will be fine. Um, we, we completed an analysis recently of like uh, about half a dozen major programs, uh, 1 billion and up. And we landed on a number that I, I'd like to share is that about 30% is the, the very minimum floor of city personnel that should be involved uh, in administering these large programs. It's because, you know, that's critical to the success, I think. And these programs are going to be a peak in activity. So it's, it's difficult to have long-term city employees and public employees. So maybe uh, there's some innovative solutions there to go hire exempt temporary positions to help the cities and the districts administer these large temporary programs. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, Senator Stern had to, had to leave the panel and I'm being you know, urged to, to, to wrap up. So let me, let me ask, I'm gonna throw out a question to. To, to all of you. And thanks again so much for participating in the panel. You've been marvelous. I mean, I, I've learned so much and enjoyed the discussion so much. But so, so, so this is the question. What would you say, each of you, real quick in about a minute, is the single most important thing we should be doing here in Southern California to secure our water future? There is one most important single thing, what would it be? Director Zaldivar, why don't you go first? Thank you, David. And uh, you know, I, I, I definitely feel that any and all water that is here already locally, we ought to turn it into beneficial reuse of some kind, every single drop of that local water. That is the one thing we should blindly just follow and do at every turn and at every opportunity. Thanks very much. Uh, Rupam, what do you think? Yeah, I would say to just keep making investments in our infrastructure. Sometimes we forget about water because it's underground and you, you're not thinking about it if you don't see it. So just continue to make those investments in whether it's new infrastructure or existing infrastructure to make sure we have a reliable water supply for the future. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe even stepping out of, of LA or, or Southern California, the, the near-term economic benefits are, are huge and they're impacting the public sector in a, in a big way. And I think, um, you know, the DC and, and Congress have definitely helped the private sector out with the, with the CARES Act, but the League of Cities found that 65% of cities are gonna cancel capital outlays or, or infrastructure projects over the next next year. So I think it's critical that the private sector encourage DC to provide stimulus and provide funding for the public sector so they can navigate through these challenges of, of COVID. Otherwise, we're going to be potentially in a year's long recession and recovery like we were last time. And all of these great plans we have and this great vision we have, it's going to extend to the right because we didn't have the resources and the finances we need. So I, I'd encourage anyone on the, that, that's listening to this that's in the private sector to really encourage uh, any contacts they have in DC to support uh, the economy and, and do that by uh, helping the public sector out and passing a stimulus measure that's really focused on them. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more that, that water, you know, is, is essential to life, but uh, improving our water situation, improving sustainability, sustainability, improving independence here is also essential to the economy. So it's it's two things and that has to be borne in mind. Gilles, please, let's have your thoughts. Yes, uh, I would say continue to garner the public support, the ratepayer support, the elected uh, official support and view these uh, infrastructure projects as local stimulus to the economy. And maybe the stars are lining up to actually build it at the discounted price, depending on what, what else happens in the economy. Fantastic. Well, on that thought, 
the panelists, thank you all so much for participating and everybody who's, who's watching this. Thank you all for being here. And again, kudos to the LABC terrific team for putting this on. And, and uh, I'm, I'm privileged uh, to have been a part of this program. Thanks so much.